Um, hi, welcome to our session on Welcome to our session, a second session on civics and citizenship. Um, my name's Laura. I'm the Executive Officer of Social Education Victoria. Um, and I'm here with Adam Brody McKenzie. Um, and we're both presenting two short sessions today. Um, mine will be on teaching critical media literacy and what are some different skills and sort of basic introductory vocabulary and theories that might help us to think about critical media skills in the context of civics and citizenship and where that would fit into the curriculum as well. Um, and then Adam is going to be speaking a little bit about the bigger picture and asking us to sort of reflect on some different elements of our practice. But before I go on, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging um, and acknowledge that this land was never ceded. Um, I'm sitting here on the land of the Wurundjeri people, but I know that there's people who might be watching this recording or zooming in from all over the state. Um, and I am also would like to say that I'm proud to continue a culture of learning that's existed on this land for a millennia. Um, so my other hat is as a media teacher, and it's a, to a topic that I'm obsessed with, um, as well as teaching humanities for many years. I taught BCE media, um, seven to 10 media, um, assessed media exams for a long time, and um, just really love the subject. Um, and also, the more that I learn about how the politics course works and how the sociology course works at a VCE level, I'm more um, amazed by the crossovers between our different subjects. Um, and so I'm going to finish actually on some of the ways in which a really robust civics course can help to support media teachers because of some of the crossovers that we see there. Um, but I'm going to go just speak for about 10 minutes today on some of the sort of key core skills that I think would help us um, and where they might fit in. So why teach media literacy? Um, so if media literacy is something that we, we know is important, but also I think the last sort of decade has shown us as um, politics becomes very polarised and the way in which we read media becomes quite polarised as well in the sense that we tend to get shared a lot of media from our friends and family and people on social media. And so we have those bubbles that we're within. Um, and also the, um, the sort of, you know, the idea of fake news, I think, is really um, has become very kind of common and mainstream sort of mistrust of mainstream journalists. Um, and also the lies told by mainstream journalists have also um, sort of come in and out of the sort of the front pages over the last couple of years. But I think so, you know, we, we teach media lit lit literacy to be able to make sense of the world. Um, in terms of the identity strands of the curriculum to help um, develop a safe sense of self, to be able to understand the way that media representations might be idealised or might be selective um, rather than a reflection of reality. Um, but we learn about media to be able to evaluate discourse and to evaluate evidence, to try and find the evidence within the narrative sometimes. Um, we want people to be able to make informed decisions and to be able to also contribute to a media narrative. We want students that are able to, you know, engage with media in a responsible um, and creative and maybe persuasive way. Um, I've looked at the levels nine and 10 of the Victorian curriculum. I think other levels sort of refer to media influence a little bit more obliquely, but at levels nine and 10, we directly have these content descriptors, um, which are to examine the influence of a range of media, including social media in shaping identities and attitudes to, to diversity and how ideas about Australian identity may be influenced by global events. And then we have analysed how citizens' political choices are shaped, including the influence of the media. So we can see this idea that students need to be able to understand what media is. They need to be able to explore the different arguments that are being made by media, and they need to be able to interpret what that means. Um, I'm going to give you two key theorists today, and this is absolutely just a starting point. But when we talk about media, um, and this is um, across media and communications in general, 
Um, there's two theorists that have really kind of started the way that we talk about it in the sort of postmodern age. Um, Stuart Hall would be one of these. Um, and he argues that media is really about representation. So represent, representing different ideas and things and places. Um, and that it's about um, really the way that you have symbols and signs that are constructed to create a particular representation of reality rather than the media being a, a mirror that, that's held up that directly um, reflects or reproduces what's happening. So Stuart Hall sort of creates this idea that the media is a construction created by selecting and emitting particular information um, or emphasizing and de-emphasizing different information. Um, and that that creates a representation of reality that's that's very um, intentional and that's very nuanced. Um, and then Marshall McLuhan, um, his sort of key idea was the media is the message. And basically he argued that the form that the media takes dictates the types of messages that are created and communicated. So if we go back to that Trump tweet before, um, a McLuhan style interpretation of that would say that you're not gonna get depth and substance in, you know, 300 characters. You're going to get something that's short, that's simplistic, that's, you know, that doesn't provide for nuance or discourse, um, that doesn't really reference things because you've got this very truncated sort of media form. Um, and so that really, that's really influential, influential, especially when we think about social media, because the technology that we're looking at creating the media dictates the kinds of topics that are discussed and also the ways that those topics are discussed. But that's the only theory that I'm going to, um, to make you go through today. But I think that understanding that those two people existed um, and that they're really um, have sort of driven the way that we understand it is a good point to depart from. I'm gonna leave you with three media skills today. The first is some language about discussing the media. Um, so understanding what we call different media um, elements, um, some analysis skills in terms of articulating how we interpret the media. So we are always interpreting the media. We're always, we're, we're interpreting all of these different messages from all around us, but being able to sort of be mindful of and articulate the ways in which that meaning and that interpretation is happening is the important part of this analysis. Um, and then the third skill is around production, so creating media. So who's got questions so far? And I'm just looking at my screen, so I can't see people's faces at the moment. So um, I didn't say before, but if you'd like to type into the chat, Adam can ask the questions of me, um, or you can just ask questions if any parts of that don't sort of makes sense or if you've got things that I'd elaborate like to go into more. Does that make sense to you, Adam? Yeah, yeah. All, okay. you're, getting, all you're getting is post positive affirmation. All right, which... I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. Yeah. So <laughs> some of the key vocabulary that you want to learn if you're talking about media is in bold on this screen. So we have media forms. So the, those are things like film or television or social media. Um, so forms are the sort of main technology that we're using. Um, then we have a, a single item of media is a media text. So a media text might be a single tweet or it could be a film, a specific film, um, or it could be a particular photograph. Genre is a way of categorizing media text. So it, that when there's different styles or different um, ways of constructing um, those media forms, we call them genres. And then we use media codes and conventions, which are symbols and ways of arranging symbols in a particular way. So those are basically the five different terms that you might need. So form, text, genre, codes can conventions and I'll go I'll keep going back to these today because having some language around what we're talking about is really helpful when you're trying to sort of analyze what is there um, and some other useful terms are things like social media or mass media um, digital digital 
we don't really need to talk about analog media, but, you know, some people who are old fashioned might be analyzing newspapers. Um, but a lot of the, t the on, like printed paper newspapers, but often we're talking about digital versions of those newspapers anyway. Um, user generated content is really helpful when you're talking about social media um, and who's actually the media producers. Um, and then ideas around media ownership are really helpful, especially when you're talking about the Australian context um, where we have a particularly concentrated media ownership. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so when we go back to those three media skills, um, we can talk about the language first. And Twitter is a form of social media. Um, a single tweet is a media text. News reporting is a genre of television. Um, and it is produced through a process of selection and omission and has its own conventions. Um, and on the resources at the end, um, there's some little videos that you can actually watch around what conventions of news media are. And I think they're really helpful to share with students, especially when we're talking about evaluating fake news. We need to understand why some fake news is so believable because it follows the conventions of something that speaks with authority. Um, I'm going to use some of this language for analysis to go into the second part. Um, so we have a media, a media form that we're looking at at the moment is a still shot from some TV. Um, the text that we're looking at is an ABC news broadcast. Um, the genre is that it's news media. Um, and sometimes we can talk about the media producer as well. So we can see from the little um, stamp in the bottom right corner that this is from the public broadcaster. Um, definitely with students in year nine and 10, I would be making sure that they understand the difference between commercial news producers and public broadcasters. Um, I would routinely have sessions with year 11 media students talking about the difference between public and private because it's assumed knowledge that students will know that because they're attending a public school that they know the difference between like a public and private service but that's really not assumed don't assume that knowledge because I've wasted many sessions talking to students about things that they just didn't understand um, so understanding who that media producer is is really important but what I've done on the right hand side of this slide is just list some of the codes that are being used um, and those codes are arranged in the way that we see them on the screen in order to create a sense of authority, to, in order to create a sense of um, trustworthiness in this particular news source. So we've got the location badge, we've got the, you know, we've got the yellow live stamp in the top left corner to indicate that it's current, that it's up to date, that it's, you know, something that you need to pay attention to. Um, you know, the man in the centre is white, he's of a certain age, he's in a suit to show that he, you know, is, is dignified and is businesslike and is um, an authority figure. And these might seem really silly or obvious, but when we start to think about media analysis and we're trying to think about the ways that we interpret news, it's really useful to actually start to think of, well, what are the things that we're seeing or that we're hearing that are creating that meaning? Um, and so we have, and if you, I'll get, I'll send these slides out, but as you can see this, if you click on this little conventions thing, it will take you to a hilarious Charlie Brooker video where he goes through news, um, conventions of news broadcasts um, in terms of why they are, um, how they're sort of constructed to give you the sense that they're something that you should pay attention to and believe. Um, when we start to do media analysis. And I was doing both of those, these things just now, um, but you wanna really step this out for students. I find that the most basic way of doing it is start off with the column that's on the left, which is the description. So this could be the symbols or this is the symbols or the signs that we're seeing. Um, this is what you're seeing and what you're hearing. So these are these, um, these image, these parts of the image that are on this slide are the literal description of what you're seeing. And if you're reading a news article, then it's the, the words that are on the page without any kind of interpretation, without any kind of um, sort of attention to their symbolic meaning. 
um, but literally interpreting or, li or trying to create meaning from what is right there in front of you without sort of reading too much into it, without trying to, I guess, understand it or critique it too much. You first want to be able to describe what's there. So you might see colours or shapes or sound effects or images or typefaces or people or places. And then after that, you want to start to think about the connotations. So I've seen this symbol. What does this symbol mean? I've seen this sort of typeface. What does that mean? I've seen this use of phrasing. What does it mean? Um, and so you can ask students to, you know, um, they, they construct the representations from these symbols and signs. They process information from them. They might laugh if it's a you know, funny piece of media. They might recognize somebody if it's you know, referencing somebody who is famous. They might be, become enraged, they might be confused. So there's a variety of different responses that we can have. Um, or they might need support in terms of interpreting the intended meaning from those media, media texts. Um, and I'm just gonna go back to a slide that was really early on to have a think about some of the, a really basic way of thinking about this idea of, um, of constructing meaning. Um, so this might seem obvious and I've, I sort of pitched it as this at people who maybe have never taught media, been in a media class or really thought about this stuff before. Um, these are three apples. Um, when you describe what an apple is, um, you have a particular idea of the fruit. Um, and then when you start to think about the ways in which different elements of these images are arranged, they, can, they create a different meaning. And your brain has done that immediately. You know that on the left-hand side, because of the texture of the image, because of the way that the light's hitting it, because of the level of detail, you know that that's a photograph of a piece of fruit. Um, you know from the centre um, image because of its flat colour, because of the way that it's got this really sort of simplistic, um, the, the shape of the leaf and the stalk and the fruit itself, it's a sort of more cartoony or maybe it's an icon or something that would be, you know, not out of place in a children's colouring book or something like that. It's a really basic cartoon image. And then you know um, without there being any colour to indicate that it's an apple or not, um, but you know from the, the shape that it's an icon for the, um, the Apple brand. Um, and your brain's interpreted that immediately, but it's really helpful when we're interpreting media to actually go, okay, well, what are the things that I'm seeing and hearing and understand that's making me draw that meaning? Because then we can step it out for students a little bit more clearly than just swinging straight to the interpretation. Um, does that idea of describing first and then and trying to analyze does that kind of two-step approach make a little bit of sense do people have questions about that have I, I it's hard to know whether I've been just um sort of talking telling you what you already know or whether I've been just like jumping into something that I'm obsessed with so um, I'm going to keep going if I don't hear any questions yeah, there's still um, no, nothing in the chat, really. I, cool, I've, cool. I've got some uh, questions, but I might save it for the end. Sure. Okay. Um, I wanted to sort of give us a chance to have a think about this, and we can go back to this a little bit later when we're not recording as well, um, which is starting to think about what are some of the... Um, the codes or the, or the symbols or the ways of arranging words and images from these little tiles. So these three tiles are all taken from different news sources. Um, I've just screen grabbed what their news front page set had about the story of the time. And so I've taken like, analysis articles or persuasive articles rather than um, sort of straight news reporting because the there was a little bit more kind of, um, I guess, attitude in the um, in the in the headlines. But one of the things that I noticed is the Annabelle Crab article includes images of women. What might that do to our interpretation of this topic? Um, you know, having having these images of you know Scott Morrison or Christian Porter. 
um, inters interspersed with pictures of Grace Tame, our Australian of the Year, or Brittany Higgins, um, how might that change our interpretation? Um, one of the things that Adam had mentioned to me when he when we were talking about doing this case study was the the language or the similarity of language between some of the um, the news limited sort of um, I guess pundits who and how they like to write about it and so this idea of witch hunters or a lynch mob um, attacking this, this victimized attorney general in the um, in the those, those lines, those um, bylines for the articles um, starts to, you start to really think about some of those topics. If we go back to um, those ideas of understanding and evaluating different interpretations in the media that were in those, um, the Victorian curriculum content descriptors, we could see how we might be able to do that by analyzing these kind of representations or, and this, I think, because it doesn't even have the full article. You wouldn't even have to, you could just analyze the, the images and the bylines. Absolutely, I think if you've got the time and you've got a group of students that you could then read the articles with, I think that would be a really great thing to do. But you can definitely get a lot of mileage in terms of media analysis by looking at the way, especially when we know that, a lot of the time people aren't reading the articles in terms of before they share them, before they promote them, before they rip them apart, before they troll the person who wrote them, um, because people are making those decisions based on the bylines that are right here. And so we get a lot of the information that we need to work with um, just here. And then I wanted to leave with this idea of producing media and I actually had in mind some of the sort of identity and citizenship strands of the Victorian curriculum um, when I was thinking about this. Um, and I use this, this is a sort of introductory, like first day of media um, activity I used with some students um, where I asked them to, you know, take a or create a, an Instagram profile shot. And I can send people the activity for this. It's dead cute. But, um, I wanted to sort of re reassure people. I know that um, that sometimes when we think about being producers of media, especially in a classroom where you might have a lot of content to get through, um, it can seem like something that's either very expensive, very time consuming, that you need a lot of technical know-how. Um, and I wanted to sort of show this as an example of, you know, getting a fair bit of mileage out of some, we can agree, pretty non-existent technology in this case, literally a uh, pen and paper. Um, but that it can actually be a really authentic way because what the students had to put together were the different codes and ways of arranging those codes that helped them to signal what they wanted to show of their identity. And so this student here, um, he hasn't put a lot of detail into it, but he knew that he wanted to be at St Paul's Cathedral in the city so that everybody knew that he was cool, that he was hanging out in the city with his friends. Um, and he wanted everybody to know that he had a Supreme brand bum bag and a Patagonia hat. Um, and that these things were like highly, highly important, that he would not be using hashtags because they were basic. Um, the ways of arranging like codes and conventions when students create media productions is a great way of them showing that they understand and also recognizing that they understand the conventions because we know the conventions, like you know, you know, very close to the start of a trailer for a romantic comedy, what genre that film is in, whether you've studied media or not, you can recognize the conventions of how it's put together. And our students do as well, but it's about drawing those out so that we can articulate it more clearly and, and, and understand how to manipulate those things more. Um, and then I think that is, oh yeah, there's some resources. And I wanted to show everybody this, when we're thinking about um, the advantages of having a really great civics course at this school, at your school, um, these are some of the topics and writing to learn activities that my year 12 media students had to do for narrative and ideology in year 12 media. Um, and so anything that we can teach students <laughs> around these topics um, is really helpful because there is so much crossover. And that is it from me. Who's got questions? Oh, um, there's a question about elaborating on Marshall McLuhan. 
Um, yeah, so he was a media theorist. Um, I think he was writing a lot in the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, but he basically um, argued that the form that media would take would dictate things like people's attention spans. Crazy, I know. Um, but it would dictate also the kind of stories that were told and the kind, because you the, me, the media is the message, I guess it's... Um, it's about the role that the media plays in our lives, um, the the role that the media, the the where where we where we view it, how we consume it. Um, so you know, for example, um, he was really concerned with the way that television had changed the way that people interacted with media, because rather than media being something that you could really choose how it would be brought into your home. You know, you could go out to a cinema, you could go and buy um, tapes or you could go and buy um, like records or you could go and buy newspapers or books. But, you know, a television is literally tubed into your home and it is whatever the programmers want, you know, and, and there's all of that kind of gatekeeping around what is on TV and what's not on TV. And so because you're then vulnerable, you can't choose what's going to be on the TV. That's not a decision that's made by the consumer. And the, um, the form that the, that media is changes the way that we understand it and changes the way that the, that the um, message is transmitted. That's my kind of um, a bit scattergun approach to Marshall McLuhan, but uh, it probably makes more sense when, um, when he talks about it. Um, also, um, one of the resources in the slides, which I'll send out is Crash Course Media Literacy, which actually goes into a lot of these theorists as well. Um, I think uh, Crash Course too have just started up a fake news. Um, mm -hmm. They're getting teenagers to, to do stuff on fake news and how to spot fake news. So, so good, so yeah. good. What are your questions, Adam? Um, I was wondering when you were talking about um, like the different the different types like in the different genres if there because I just find like one of the things that I find difficult when doing media literacy is is looking at um, trustworthiness um, and um, it seemed to be that like because and so because you're coming at this for, as, as a media teacher, mm -hmm. it just seems um, the way that you're encapsulating and describing the media in terms of um, type and, and, and genre in that, I just, um, yeah, it seems, it seems like a useful way of maybe trying to determine trustworthiness. But I was just wondering if that's something that you ever like talked about. Yeah, in absolutely. absolutely. You, well, I think there's, there's a couple of different things. So there's a lot of, um, there's a, when, when you kind of, it, it, and it start, it depends on which layer of knowledge around media you're wanting people to engage with, because, you know, we have this idea, or at least I had this idea that when we're talking about, you know, reliability of, of, um, of media, and you, get, you hear it kind of brought up a lot, is this dichotomy between tabloids and broadsheets, you know, in terms of how, you know, people will say, oh, that, you know, the sun is just a tabloid in the UK, and that's why they spread lies around Megan. Um, and, you know, but the age is a broadsheet. And, it, and it's, um, there's a lot of class-based, like, information there. There's a lot of it's a business decision. And the age, which is a broadsheet, is actually a tabloid shape now, um, even though they still call it a broadsheet. Um, and so what I guess I'm saying is that there's a lot of kind of knowledge around how, why we find things reliable that is, is only helpful if we can articulate it clearly. Mm. Um, and so... I guess one of the things that I would argue and that I would talk a lot with students about is paywalled versus non-paywalled media um, because, you know, there's, there is something around legitimacy that, and, and I talk a lot about press associations, um, you know, around, so, you know, if we talk about the press club in Australia, they publish a journalist's code of conduct, which journalists sign on to. And so even if you've got two people who both have 100,000 followers, 
you know, one of them is actually a journalist that's connected to the press club that's, you know, that's a member of a respected kind of media institution which has its own issues anyway, When, as I'm saying it, I'm like, that doesn't mean that they're foolproof, but you can use that as a, as a way of kind of indicating that, that if you're taking these two places and one of them has a Walkley Award or like one of them is like a respected member of the press sort of gallery, and then one of them is like somebody who's like selling, you know, um, anti-vax helmets or something, then you can start to analyze it in that way. But I think it's also just really important, especially when when the quality of the fake news is so good that that students um, not that they should be paranoid, but that they they really I think it's actually our job sometimes to give them a list. Like I give my students, I would give media students a list of reliable newspapers like mm -hmm. give them a list of reliable media sources. And if they want to use other media sources, let me know what they did to evaluate it. Because I, um, I think that it's really, you know, just because something uses the conventions of news media doesn't mean that it's actually worth reading. Mm. And, and the, the, it's so easy to fake it. The, um, it's interesting you brought up the public versus private thing, because I think one thing, um, I found too is that I think the private thing is pretty easy to explain like these companies are doing it for profit and that's whether it is the sun or it's the new york times yeah. there is that commercial element to what they're doing mm -hmm. um, but with the public it gets tricky because I find that there'll often be students in the uh, class you know from from um, whose parents are from other countries. So, so when talking about public broadcasters, they don't necessarily have the same level of trust because they're used to public broadcasters being disseminators of propaganda. Totally. Um, and so talking about the ABC and the BBC and how they yeah. have their own charters and that kind of thing, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's and, and And that's, you know, there's a, there's a huge sort of, you know, body of work that, that you know, there's a, an outcome in VCE media is around like media ownership and how the Australian media industry works so that people can have time to unpack those things or, or unpack pack how we regulate media, you know, which would have been a really fun couple of weeks to teach students over the last, <laughs> you know how Adam, you ghoulishly talk about when terrible things happen, how great it is for politics teachers. Yeah. Um, when the news banned, um, when Facebook banned like news media sources, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been that would have been amazing. That's very. Yeah. I see the comment from Tara as well around. Yeah, that's ex exactly. I've talked to uh, drama and art. I think it's a really standard template for um, for for analysis of like what actually happened and then what it, what the meaning is. But I think it is really important for to, just to, to, to create that, those extra steps because there's so much information and we're interpreting it so quickly. Like we're interpreting it so quickly and making those judgments so quickly that the more kind of space we can put in there to, um, to actually think about how that process is happening will help with our analysis. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say one other one other part about um, sort of the types of things I think that's important too is I, it just reminded me of a conversation I had once where I was showing um, memes from a Facebook page called ALP Spicy Meme Stash, I think it was called. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I, I know that that is is run by the ALP it's run by the Labour Party mm -hmm. and and I just mentioned that in passing in the class and then they were all like whoa 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 what do you mean what do you mean that political parties are making memes and like when you're talking about fake news and 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 making fake news look really professional it goes both ways too right in fake news they're they're also you know i think students think that if there's a person in a youtube video talking to them that that person is more genuine and, and personable mm. and not just just the you know voice of, of some government or interest group or anything else so i think it's also Absolutely. getting them to acknowledge those things about the media that they use and how that's also being manipulated and also things like how um 
how low culture or, you know, like low culture, like meme culture or, um, you know, imagery around memes is sort of like taken and hijacked in um, in these really spectacular as, as a sort of um, as a password or as a coded um, a coded version of the things that are too controversial to say. So like that idea of Peppy the Frog mm -hmm. that's been um, both taken on as a symbol of revolution and democracy in Hong Kong because it's just a green cartoon frog, like it's not offensive, but then is also a symbol of like basically like neo-fascist, like white supremacists as well in the West, which I think is crazy and amazing, but that, you know, it has like, uh, even low culture has like value and meaning in the sense that it's a powerful, powerful image. Mm. Well, and then the protests in Southeast Asia, they do the Hunger Games. Yeah, the they? Hunger Games salute. Yeah. yeah. Um, over to you, Adam. I'm going right. to, we've got about 20 minutes, Gosh. half an hour. Off you go. I just um, went really over time. I hate it when my presenters go over time and then I just went over time. No. That was good. That was that was really interesting. I don't know. I don't know how everyone else found, but I really enjoyed. Yeah, because you are a media teacher, I just really enjoyed bringing you know, bringing that expertise to this area that I have tried teaching about, and but um, but not from a media perspective, from like a. a well, I, I think it's also helpful because I know that you know if media if students are learning media literacy in terms of their media subject their English teacher and their humanities teacher, their civics teacher, they're going to get like four different versions of media literacy. Um, mm -hmm. And that's cool, but like it would be kind of cool as well if there was some shared language around it. Definitely. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll get a start. So I actually wanted to start with um, you, with, with everyone here. I wanted to get an idea of what uh, you think. So, so like Laura said, I'm going to be sort of talking more about the big picture scope of civics and citizenship education uh, in terms of purpose and theory and 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 what's uh, involved. I guess from it from a ideological or um, from a theoretical stance, but. Before I did that and before I infected your minds with what other people have done research on and that kind of thing, uh, I actually just wanted to know what, what you guys think. Uh, I, I got the impression from, from last week that there are quite a few of you that, that you're not new to this type of teaching, that, that um, you've been doing this teaching in one way or another for a little while. So I don't know if you have used Mentimeters. Um, can you see the Mentimeter? Um, so, yes, no. Yeah. So if you if you go to menti.com and then it will ask you for a code and, and you just punch in this code uh, up here. Um, if, uh, yeah, if you guys wouldn't mind just putting in even just a couple of words um, would be would be valuable. All right, first off the rank. So it is anonymous too, right? So feel free to really say whatever it is you want. All right, so Citizens is getting a workout. Is there any, I think there's seven of us, so I don't know if there's a couple of more people wanting to add. That's all good. Mm. 
I love that one about to create empowered citizens. Yeah. Um, so what I want to do now, I guess, is um, sort of uh, point out some of um, the tension that emerges in this subject due to the fact that I think pretty much what everyone's written down, um, like I, I, I think are really great um, aspirations and, and you know, um, aims for, for this type of education. But one of the things that where this gets um, mixed up a little bit in, in the research and in the policy and in, even in the curriculum writing, and then for us when we're trying to put this in the practice, say, say, say take for example even the Create Empowered Citizens, there's going to be those people in Australia who think that empowered means um, so that when they turn 18, they know how preferential voting works. And there are going to be other people who think that an empowered citizen is someone who hits the streets uh, for protests. Um, and this is a real tension that we have in this subject because um, that can that can also relate to active citizenship, right? Is active citizenship someone who makes sure they're putting their bins out every week and um, you know is uh, paying making sure that they're paying their parking fines? Is is an informed uh, citizen someone who's reading the Herald Sun every morning or um, someone who is um, follows get up um, on um, Twitter. Um, so, so there are ways that because these things are so, are so subjective, um, it, it, it can be um, that the subject itself can sort of be manipulated in, in all kinds of different ways. So even the response to support to, to, to um, students to grow as citizens to be tolerant, um, I think we know that there is a group of Americans, say, who see tolerance as being anti-American um, and, and, and against American citizenship. Um, then, then there's even the idea of who is, who is a citizen uh, and, and um, who, who gets to have citizenship and, and what are the characteristics of that citizenship. So you know, for example, um, from what, what I was speaking about next week, you know, uh, sorry, last week, you know that, that I'm an advocate for treating young people as citizens, right? And some people would just say, Adam, you're nuts. They can't vote, right? They can't fight in the defense force. What do you mean young people are citizens? They don't, they don't have full citizenship because, because they're minors. Um, whereas when I'm saying that students are citizens, it's, it's related more to uh, the fact that they already exist in, in this world uh, with us, um, with, with the rest of us, um, and um, that they have the power to, to change that, that community and that society that they're a part of, even though, even though they're, they're, they're children, right, or, or minors or, or not, yet, not yet 18. So um, this, uh, I think these are all really great um, uh, responses for what the purpose of civics and citizenship is but you can see how when you start to you know in your head too you know very well what you mean when you say what the purpose of civics and citizenship is but then you can see then when you uh put it on a put it on a page put it on a piece of paper that it can get twisted right it can get twisted in one way or another and um i showed i showed these last week but these are the the aims of the um, Australian curriculum and of the Victorian curriculum, which again are pretty much word for word the same, except the Australian curriculums um, decided to emphasize the importance of Australia's Christian heritage, um, which is, you know, very much a political statement in and of itself as well. Um, and you can see how in these aims, they do also seem similar um, to uh, what you guys had been uh, writing just then. Um, even in the lifelong sense of belonging, um, 
there isn't a sense in these aims of it being about um, becoming, right? So that once they're 18, they become citizens. It says a lifelong long sense of belonging to an engagement with civic life as an active and informed citizen so that they are these things uh, right now. To have the capacities and dispositions to participate in the civic life of their nation at a local, regional and global level. This isn't, this isn't something to, that's going towards the future. These are um, what the curriculum is expecting of, of, um, of young people that are studying this subject right now, right? Um, so, um, which is also just important, I guess, for, for, for us to acknowledge that um, the, the, the bounds that, that within, within all of this, and, and this, is, this is a slide from last time of just thinking about what civics and citizenship means now in this moment at the beginning of, of 2021. Uh, and I think that what Laura just presented for us too is 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 useful towards towards finding and achieving that that uh, those aims. Um, I also wanted to remind us um, of this that that you know in a lot of those purposes you're talking about um, sort of a, a young person being empowered, uh, but but that doesn't need to be the aim of civics and citizenship at all. And in fact. Um, so in, in, in other countries and, and most notably in China, civics and citizenship is used as an, as an indoctrination um, uh, for the uh, Communist Party of China um, and, and quite openly so the, to, to, to express and, and, and indoctrinate people into the values of, of the Communist Party. Um, I don't even think that's a controversial statement. I don't think anyone in the Chinese government would... Uh, dispute that um, but also um, be, because there is this place that civics and citizenship can can play in indoctrination it also means that um, people in general can be suspicious of this kind of subject as well right because I think because it does have the possibility of indoctrination um, it means that um, people and by that I mean parents students other teachers can be suspicious about well, if we're doing this, if we're learning about this civics and this citizenship, what are you trying to indoctrinate students into, right? And there are people who are, are, are concerned that uh, helping students uh, become activists and become social justice uh, activists in particular um, isn't something they think should be, should be happening in, in schools. Um, so, so yeah, there's a, there's there's a real tension there into what this this subject can be. Um, Australia has had a really hard time grappling with this subject, uh, largely because there was civics and citizenship in schools actually uh, up until around the 1960s, and then in the 1960s, um, with um, you know the, the the civil rights movements that were happening here as well as as well as in the US, they no longer. The, the civics courses were indoctrinating people into a love of queen and country um, and into, um, you know, traditional Anzac values and the sort of um, revolutionaries at the time or hippies or whatever that were pushing against that and said, no, that isn't, that isn't what we stand for at all. And, and, and as a consequence of that, there's still an awkwardness in relation to this subject because when we talk about citizenship, um, Within this, within this subject, what are we talking about? Are we talking about um, the, the blonde, strong Anzac, uh, or are we talking about the, um, you know, um, multicultural, um, complex, pluralistic society in which we live? Um, so then I just want to take a step back in terms of purpose of education. And I mentioned this, this briefly um, last week, but it, I find this guy called Biesta, it's really useful into understanding why we do the things we do in education. And he says that there are three reasons um, 
for education, for the purposes of education, that people use, right? So he's not even saying that this is what they should be. He's just saying that if you think about it for a second, these are the three justifications that people have for education. And the first one's qualification, and that's really the one that we're most comfortable with. It's that, it's that idea of the VCE is, is, a, is a qualification. It's a tertiary entrance mark that gets people into something. But also a citizenship. If you pass the citizenship test, that would be a qualification that says, yes, you are an Australian citizen. Then um, the most pervasive or within what's sometimes called the hidden curriculum is socialization. And, that, and that's that, that through the very act of our classroom practices, our school practices and everyone interacting with each other is that we're socializing um, students into a particular way of behaving. And then that's where like you get Theory, um, uh, socio sociologist theorists like Bourdieu, who says that schools exist to replicate the middle class uh, or to replicate the upper middle class. So it's that idea that we're getting socialized into a particular kind of person. And then subjectification is a weird way. It's because of sort of what Biesta learns in other ways, but it's, it's essentially individuality. It's how we letting young people be themselves and how are we allowing that opportunity? And actually by promoting subjectification and individuality, Biesta argues is an incredibly democratic act within a pluralistic society. So to allow there to be as diverse number of all of us as there can be. And so that when uh, education is, is um, when we're doing education, when we're teaching, we should be keeping these three purposes in mind in terms of, in terms of the justification and thinking about what is dominating how we teach is it qualification socialization or subjectification and he generally thinks that subjectification isn't a big part of it but that that's therefore disempowering towards people's own individuality because of that because because we're not highlighting it and we're not addressing it we're therefore disempowering young people because we're not giving them space for their for their own individuality so I think that's just that's just really useful. So um, I wanted us to do another Minty, actually, um, but I've just looked at the time. Um, so sorry, I must have been taking it slow at the beginning there. Instead, I guess I'll just rush through this then. Um, I wanted to find out from you guys what you thought might be the difference between minimal versus maximal citizenship. But instead, I'll just tell you. So this guy called Terence McLaughlin decided that all, all education in civics and citizenship is on, is on this spectrum and minimal is on one side. And um, what they're trying to, what minimal is all about is um, learning the basics of civics. So um, it could be um, voting, it would be um, systems of government the prime minister, things like that, right? The facts of civics, this is our legal system. These are the courts. This is the court hierarchy. Um, and, and also he does link this with a particular kind of pedagogy. It will be the teacher telling the student, this is citizenship, right? And the, and the student will nod and it's that sort of banking model. Uh, then on the flip side, there's maximal citizenship, which is, meant to be about um, uh, critical reflection is really important. So for students to critically reflect on who they are as citizens, to act as citizens, to not just be telling students what it is, but instead for them to be finding out what it is for themselves. That's not so much based in, the, in, the, in these core basic civics, uh, like the core hierarchy or things like that, but rather participating in that society. And that's sort of seen as a spectrum now I find it a bit problematic actually, because I kind of think to get to the maximal, you need the minimal. Um, I, like if you're protesting and you don't know what you're protesting about, um, you know, th there, is, there is value in the knowledge of that. Um, but, but the way that McLaughlin has created this spectrum is, is how a lot of people think about civics and citizenship and particularly um, in, in research, so. That's, that's kind of useful. And then the last one is these um, American and a Canadian guy called Westheimer and Kahn. And what they did, they did a big study of, of civics and citizenship in the US. And they found that when students were learning civics and citizenship, it was in one of these three ways. So the first one was, and the most common 
was trying to create personally responsible citizens. So citizens that um, uh, learn to, um, you know, respect other people, uh, control their anger, um, pay their taxes, um, and that, that was the, the main thing. A participatory citizen was someone who was, was learning to vote, who was happy to write a letter to their um, MP uh, for, for some reason, um, where as a justice oriented citizen was basically fighting against the system and, and trying to uh, right, right the wrongs that the system had created. And you know, you could think about things like Black Lives Matter would be very much a justice oriented. So, so if you think about this in terms of if there's a homeless person there, a personally responsible um, citizen um, would give would give the homeless person some money. A participatory sister, uh, citizen might work in a soup kitchen and 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 feed homeless people, uh, whereas a justice oriented system uh, uh, citizen is going to um, think about how did that homelessness happen in the first place and how can they adjust it to ensure that that the, the homeless person isn't there anymore. So that there's something wrong with society's current system that that. that that um, homeless person exists. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just conscious of time. I was going to ask you guys about how you think um, the, these different things can 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 uh, obviously be, play an important part in in the context and purpose, um, and and where they can be at odds with one one another at times. Um, Maybe a given time. I guess I'll, I'll. I guess I guess I'll more more or less stop here. These are three really significant um, uh, research. Uh, not researchers, theorists, educational theorists on sort of more active citizenship that are worth having a look at. And we um, will absolutely go into all of those in our next series in term two, Adam. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah. Good. It's a teaser. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and then particular pedagogies that can be really useful to sort of achieve particular particular things. Um, I guess also raising um, there's a, there's sort of a dilemma for progressive teachers. I think where in terms of what I was talking about with Biesta earlier, if you're teaching students for social justice, and I think probably most of us in this room think that that might be a nice idea. We've got to think about the indoctrination part of that as well, though, and the socialization. And are we just indoctrinating students into a particular way of thinking if we're making them advocate for social justice? And is that therefore giving up some of their own individuality? And now, is there a tension there, right? Because obviously, there's there's a real democratic purpose to allowing their individuality to come to to the fore, particularly in a pluralist society. So there's a real tension there like what do we want to get out do we want them to be themselves do we want them to be social justice um activists um and i think yeah just sort of questioning and reflecting on that can be important in terms of how we're teaching this subject um and then um i wanted to end i guess with with these two provocative quotes from biesa over the years um i think um, the first one is just really worth reflecting on because this is for all of your subjects. This isn't just for civics and citizenship. So this is for your drama or for your media. To think about the fact that education always comes to students as an act of power. So their education is like political, even in everything that we're doing. And that one thing that we need to acknowledge is that when we're even allowing students to do more inquiry learning or to do that, their own thing too. That is something that we are we are giving them, um, and then and then how they're choosing to interpret that can be very different, right? Some 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 students respond better when they're asked to be compliant uh, than when they're asked to to think for themselves, and that that's really up to them. Um, and um, it's also just really important for us to remember that what we're teaching and particularly in this area where there can be so many different interpretations 
that what we're teaching isn't necessarily what they're learning. And so for us to be cognizant of that when we're teaching civics and citizenship um, and to uh, think about if that is the case, to what extent do we need to be in their way or to what extent can we uh, let them go and, and learn things for themselves? Um, yeah, and I guess I'll just leave it there because I'm conscious of time. Adam, thank you so much.